Oh, I love the Lord. And he heard my cry. Well, and he, well, he pitied every groan. And as long as I live and trouble rise, well, I will, oh, I'll hasten to his throne. I will, oh, I'll hasten to God's throne. Ah, well, I love the Lord. She bowed her ear. Well, she chased my blues away. Whoa. What do I have to fear? Well, I have breath to pray. Well, I have breath to pray. Whoa, what do I have to fear? Well, I have breath to pray. Well, I have breath to pray. Wait in the water. Wait in the water, children, wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. Wait in the water. Wait in the water, children, wait in the water. One more time. church and the preacher calling you at any minute for any time. <laughs> just, you just got to be ready. <laughs> That's the kind of evening we're going to have. We're going to be spontaneous, we're going to be joyful, we're going to be meaningful as well, uh, telling a story that is important that will help us to understand the context of living in what someday we hope it will be a multiracial democratic society. Amen? Amen. My brothers, brothers, and sisters, amen. amen. <laughs> My Christian brothers and sisters, amen. amen. My Jewish brothers and sisters, amen. amen. My pagan brothers and sisters, amen. amen. My, my, my Islamic brothers and sisters, amen. amen. <laughs> Who am I forgetting? My Native American brothers and sisters. Baha'i. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Amen, amen. Multiracial, multi, multicultural, democratic society which is the vision that Dr. Benson Harley is promoting as he continues on his ministry that started as a, as a friend, compatriot, and colleague of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. In opening this program, I'm going to first introduce to you Dr. Carol Blackshaw Belai, who will introduce Dr. Harley. Then we will have two presentations and then move into the dialogue part of our evening. Dr. Carroll. All right, thank you, Brother Don. Yeah, well, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for being here. My name is Carol Blackshar Balai. I'm the Provost and Chief Academic Officer here at Naropa. It is a great honor for me to introduce Dr. Vincent Harding to you this evening. Dr. Harding was born in Harlem, New York, and attended New York City Schools, and graduated, and after that, went to the City College of New York, 
received a BA in history. Dr. Harding also earned an MS in journalism and an MA and PhD from the University of Chicago in Chicago, Illinois. <laughs> All right. After the death of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Dr. Harding emerged as one of the leading spiritual and moral thinkers on the issue of American values. He is largely responsible for the creation of the Institute of the Black World, a think tank in Atlanta, Georgia, that sought to express the special quality of African sensibility in discovering and recovering the human spirit. Dr. Harding is a long time activist, historian, and theologian, and he has personally inspired me as an activist, a scholar, and a person of faith. His major book entitled, There is a River, The Black Struggle for Freedom in America, is an eloquent portrayal of African American understanding and that we as a people have always been pushing the civil and human rights of every human being in the society in which we live and throughout the world. This evening we have an amazing opportunity to share in a community conversation with Dr. Hardy, enabling us to engage as a community with one of the most insightful and compassionate movement elders. This is a precious and rare opportunity, and I am so glad that you are here to participate in this dialogue. So my sisters and brothers, it is my deep honor to welcome Dr. Vincent Harding to speak with us tonight. Thank you. First of all, do we have any other Naropa administrators with us? So can you please stand? Susan, top, <laughs> undergraduate dean, chief, uh, chief uh, financial officer. School directors, please stand up for Any school directors? Faculty. Faculty. Any faculty? Amen, amen, amen. <laughs> Staff. Most important people, students. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. As we were planning this event, um, Dr. Hardy really wanted to have an intergenerational rep representation as well as focus on the arts, telling stories as a way of presenting uh, the issues that have evolved in a multiracial democratic society. We, as we talked, we really realized, especially through Dr. Harding's leadership, that one of our own students, in the case of Jeffrey Nearing, was very important in trying to understand some of those issues. And so we're going to have a performance from uh, our hip hop community on the campus. Where is Tasha? Tasha? <laughs> <laughs> Tasha and her crew, Tasha's going to get her crew. <laughs> and also one of, one of our own graduates is also a, a professor at Front Range Community College, Miles Golden. Uh, Miles Golden, Miles Golden, she's also, she's teaching a production class at Front Range Community College. They develop a, a play, The Case of Jeffrey Mary, which we'll, we'll hear more about. All right. <laughs> and some of her students are, are, here, are here as well. Uh, after after these, these two uh, performances, I'm going to ask our community respondents, community witnesses, you know who you are, <laughs> to come up and take the seats along with Dr. Harding in order to begin our conversation. 
Dr. Harney will not be making a formal speech or presentation, but he wants to be a participant in the dialogue that we'll, that we'll have tonight, uh, which for me is very democratic, don't you think? <laughs> so in a way he's modeling, he's modeling what he believes and the way we, we structured this, uh, this particular pre presentation. I also want to give my uh, warm regards to uh, Dr. Carol Blackshaw Belay. She's been a real friend, a real ally of the uh, community, especially those of us of color, faculty of color. Unfortunately, this is Carol's last semester here, and we will miss her greatly. I think we should give her a hand. She stepped into the breach of a very difficult and trying time uh, in the history of Europa University. When I came here two years ago and we were in crisis. We were in crisis and through Carol's capable leadership, she kept us from being unaccredited at least. <laughs> and from leading the charge to really, to really uh, getting us on the way on solid ground in terms of our academic programs. And we really, Carol, we owe you a debt of gratitude. So, uh, Sister Tasha, you about ready? Oh, you sure now? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> Tasha is an undergraduate here at Naropa. She was in my culture diversity class, and uh, uh, she's interesting. <laughs> Hello, you guys. I'm a little sick, so if I mess up, I apologize now. But I'm going to try. Yo, I arrive into Boulder every day. It's so white. Even the snow is so bright. What if the snow were black? Can you handle that? Maybe not. I'm still digesting this. Sorry, but Boulder is so white. If I walk by, admit it, uh, you will be at fright. I don't bite. You're shocked. Your compassion is blocked. Gandhi and MLK fought for us to hold hands, play in the sand, fill the motherland. I see your money by how you wear your ray bands. A wise man said to be the change you wish to see in the world. Got money for war, but can't feed the poor. Uh, can't feed the poor. Yo, yo. Darkness does not... Drive out darkness, uh, I'm okay. Darkness does not drive out darkness, uh, I'm okay. Yo, did you hear what I had to say? Let's think about it. Who planted that seed of greed, of slavery? Who made us all bleed? The sex, the war on drugs is the reality of Adam and Eve. I'm a sin reborn again. Do you feel my heart? Maybe not. Maybe I skip the beat. Forget the paper. Man, I'm standing on my feet. Do you feel me? No, but we feel the greed. Melody, harmony, no peace on my side. But I swear, I love everyone. An eye for an eye makes the world blind. An eye for an eye makes the world blind. I'm a sin reborn again. I'm a sin reborn again. Uh. Let me see, let me see, let me heal, let me love, let me be. United we stand, divided we fall. United we stand, divided we fall. Why do we have war? Why can't we feed the poor? Yo, uh, yo, let the beat drop, uh. Yo, let the beat drop, oh. I'm not perfect, but I got a flow that you will never understand, no. Yo, but I'ma be the one to change the world with my bright colors, cause I am a bright color, yo. I am black, it's a fact, but I'm smart, yes. Don't deny me, no. But we can hold hands or we can separate, but if we separate, we will not have a plate to eat off of, serving each other hate. No, 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 let's motivate, uh. Does the beat sound weird? That's okay, cause right now, right now, it's what you hear, uh. 
Yo, I'm cool like school. Oh, I'm cool like school. I don't know. Yo, but yeah, thank you. <laughs> Tasha, Mickey, and Calvin, one more time. One more time. <laughs> when Tasha gave her uh, presentation in the Culture University class, she had us popping and locking and carrying on. So, <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah, I appreciate Tasha. She's, she's all right. She's all right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have a play excerpt the case, from the case of Jeffrey Neary, directed by Miles Golden, instructor of the theater production class at Front Range Community College. Hi, everyone. Uh, hi. hi. So, so I just wanted to briefly tell you about um, what we've been doing in the production class. Can you hear me? Okay. Briefly, what we did in the production class, we spent 15 weeks um, researching Jeffrey Nearing, and I heard about this right before our semester started and went to the vigil that was held here back in March, I think, um, and I'm not sure of the, the time. But one of the things that we found, this was a very interesting case for us because, um, because of the circumstances and because it's in the Boulder community, so we wanted to make sure that there was a lot of um, there was a lot of content, and actually there is a lot of content. Um, it's taken from interviews, so you'll see about five or six moments, okay, um, that are put together with transitions, and all of the the speaking, all of the text, is found text either through interviews um, with people that. Um, people that said this they would interview with our students um, or from newspaper. So I hope that you enjoy it and they'll take a bow and then I'll introduce them to you. Okay, so thank you so much. Sister to temptation, the brother of selfishness, and all that other shit. Ladies and gentlemen, all the fucking trouble. Can I talk about this game? I said you heard me. Cliches like that, you know they want me, you don't want me. Don't touch me, you know God they care that call me. You asshole, think the substance that your ass don't stick. I bring you to the book of truth and I'll let you think. Whatever happened to that real hip hop? All I hear on that radio is straight bitch pop. Sing for the girls, sing for the Jeffrey Carter Nearing is accused of trying to slit a man's throat on University Hill, but the four inch long cut to Jason Patrick Chilson's neck may have been caused when his friend tackled Nearing.
letter from John Matthews. Unfortunately, Jeff has the misfortune of being an imposedly large black man in a predominantly white middle class community. An unflattering photo of him from the night of the brawl has been repeatedly printed beside inaccurate and sensational reports of the events of that night, including a picture of a knife that had nothing to do with the crime scene. Jeff was never identified as a graduate student in good standing at Naropa University. He was described as a homeless man. In fact, Jeff had the key to an apartment he was moving out of, plus two nights paid ahead at the youth hostel. It was August, and like many students, he was in transition, not homeless. But homeless looks so much better next to the giant black man in the picture than graduate student. He had received a bachelor's degree. He had never committed a crime before. He had had some brushes with the law, but nothing serious. Jeffrey's like the nicest guy in the world. I got to know him during the course of the trial, and he's like a gentle giant. This is just so out of character for him, for him to come to a Buddhist school. He actually spent six months in Japan, too, studying the Heart Sutra which is one of the central teachings of Buddhism about love and compassion. It's just not Jeffrey. But when he's off his medication and when he's medicated himself through drugs and alcohol, it's a different Jeffrey. An interview with a former prosecutor for the city and county of Denver. Culpability has less to do with the truth than it does with what can be proven. It has more to do with the way the laws are interpreted and presented through different perspectives and distortions by the parties involved, and less to do with actual events. It's a different game in the judicial system than it is in many aspects of life. It's not black and white. In 
a letter from Jeffrey Neary from prison. Dear Gina, I got your note and receipt for the deposit of money into my inmate account. Thanks for doing that. I didn't know any money was collected to support me, and I think it's important to let you know that I'm not financially troubled. It is because I'm financially secure that I feel wrong in accepting the money and will use the $255 to pay down my restitution. I still need to figure out how to pay my restitution and what entity services those fees. But I think that's the best way about going about things. All things being relative, I suppose I'm doing all right in prison. So for prison has been a lesson in how to tolerate loneliness and boredom punctuated by the occasional rumors about my sexuality. These rumors coupled with difficult individuals has necessitated a cool head in the face of conflicts, and I just had to let a lot of things slide. For the most part, people are respectful. Inmates generally want to do their time as smoothly as possible, but it seems like there are always something amiss in terms of gossip, but I digress. Keep up the good work. Be well, Gina. Best regard. Jeffrey. They worked really hard in a very short amount of time, and we just wanted to give just a little taste of our experiences and what we've learned about Jeffrey Nearing in this case. So I'd like to introduce you to, um, to our performers tonight. This is Charity Hurd. <laughs> Maria Plagas. Gregory Aegis. Kate Fisher. I'm Miles Golden. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miles and crew. I never looked so pretty. <laughs> <laughs> appreciate all their hard work. They spent hours interviewing folks involved in the case. And um, Miles has done a wonderful job in, uh, in shape. When is, when is the play, Miles? It's, um, it's called The Case of Jeffrey Nearing. And it's, we're, doing a, we're doing a full version of it next Thursday at Front Range Community College. If you wish to come, uh, it'll look very different from this. But these are just moments that we chose that we really liked that we could put together. Thank you. Let's give one more hand, please. At this time, I'd like the community respondents to take your places, including Dr. Harding. You know who you are. We may need a couple more chairs.
Harding asked for uh, those who had been uh, really involved in the case at different levels, students, faculty, staff, to be willing to, to engage in a conversation. Uh, and so for the next 30 minutes or so, we're going to allow people to speak their mind about what that case meant to them and uh, then proceed from there. I start off by telling you how glad I am to be with you this evening. And you may not want to clap after I say that one of the reasons why I want to be with you is so that we can talk together. Not just to talk to you, at you, but so that we can engage each other. I have been deeply affected by a fascinating 20th century woman who wrote these words. It is when we are in dialogue that we are most human. I believe that deeply. And it seems very clear to me that Naropa should be a place for people to be human. And therefore, for me, that means Naropa should be a place for people to engage in dialogue with each other. And that means for me that there are all kinds of things that I'd like to hear from you. And I volunteer to respond to whatever you may want to hear from me. But you will have to take the risks of asking strange questions, of saying silly, quote, things. And I will just be telling you at every point, the only thing silly is not to ask what's on your heart. So I want to encourage us in this process really to be with one another and to see if there are ways in which we can encourage one another. Because at its best, this is not simply an evening with Dr. Vincent Harding. This is an evening as well with Tasha and her Sangha, with Jeffrey, and his tragedy. <coughs> this is an evening with Carol, an evening with Judith, an evening with every name that you have. This is an evening with us together. And I want to thank very much my friends who came from Front Range to share Jeffrey with us. May I ask, just to start out, how many of you had never heard of Jeffrey Nearing before this time this evening? May I see your hands? Good, thank you, thank you. As we think about that, there may have been about, at most, 15 hands raised among us in the group here. As we think about that, I'd like to pick up the question that's raised in the program.
what role does Jeffrey Nearing play for us? Us meaning Naropa, us meaning Boulder, us meaning anybody who is here. What role does Jeffrey Nearing play? Or what role has Jeffrey Nearing played for you? I'd be glad to hear questions, comments, stories, ideas, shouts, songs. I gather there are a lot of folks who can do a lot of singing around here. <laughs> so all of the above, your response to Jeffrey Neary. You are good looking people, but I don't want to simply sit here and look at you in your goodness. Yes, my brother, let me indicate a little bit of process that is always important for me wherever I engage in dialogue. And that is that anybody who speaks or asks or whatever coming into the voicing of themselves would identify themselves because I am absolutely certain that anonymity and democracy do not go together. So what I'd like to hear is your full name, where you spent your childhood, your mama's mama's full name. <laughs> of course, here they would say your maternal grandmother's full name. <laughs> and where she spent her childhood. And what do you do around Naropa or Boulder or wherever you are around? Those four things begin to identify us. One, full name. Two, where we spent our childhood. Three, mama's mama's full name and where she spent her childhood. And four, really five if you watch closely. <laughs> and four or five, what do you do around Naropa, Denver, anything else that identifies you as where you are and what you do. So my brother, you have the wonderful opportunity of demonstrating to us now. <laughs> well, I'm, uh, I'm Richard Sherman. Actually, I pulled my right Is there another mic that we can use? While the mic is being passed over, may I just call your attention to certain things about democracy? It is not democracy when one person has a mic taped on to her or him, and the others we have to figure out how do we get that voice heard. It may be that as Naropa thinks about its becoming a more and more perfect union, microphones might have some role to play. Uh, I'm Richard Sherbinak. I grew up in the uh, lower west side of Cleveland, Ohio. Mm. And my maternal grandmother, if I can remember correctly, her name is Catherine Ridella. She's been dead for many years now. Uh, she grew up in uh, some small town, I think it's named Shambron in the Republic of Slovakia, Thank Eastern, you. Eastern Europe. Thank you, good. And uh, 
and I just uh, have had a relationship, uh, uh, sort of a uh, casual relationship with Naropa for the last 20 years or so, and I just have a curiosity about what Naropa does, and uh, and I like to attend events like this to uh, to see what those right brain people are thinking as opposed to CPAs like myself. Mm. <laughs> but. Uh, uh, basically, I, I, I don't know much about Jeffrey Nearing, but I received a letter as part of the email as an invitation to, to what's going on here. And uh, it seemed like uh, he was convicted of attempt first attempted first degree murder, is that right? That's right. These are the experts who are here. Second degree, second degree murder is what it was. And so, I don't really, I don't really have any of the background to know why we're talking about him particularly tonight, Correct. except that, uh, that apparently there's there was some question about his uh, his guilt or innocence in spite of the fact that he was convicted. I guess that that was just a question, as sort of background mm -hmm. for understanding okay, what good. what we're discussing. And your first name again is Richard. Is Richard, it? yes. Good. Richard raises a very interesting point for us to enter into our conversation. What in the world is Jeffrey doing at Naropa? Somebody in prison at Naropa. What does Naropa have to do with people who are in prison? <coughs> One doesn't see that normally in the public relations materials. <laughs> <laughs> you had your hand up. Please. My name is Jampa Briggs. I didn't get your first name. Jampa. Jampa. Jampa, J-A-M-P-A. Beautiful, thank you. Thank you. And uh, I spent my childhood in Forest Park, which is a sub suburb of Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, my grandmother's name was Annette Worsham Lloyd, and she grew up in Oxford County, Georgia, which was um, about an hour and a half east of Atlanta. I knew Jeffrey as a classmate at Naropa. I'm a divinity student, and he was a religious studies student. We had some of our first year classes together, and I was in a discussion group with Jeffrey in one of our classes, so I got to know him a little better through that discussion group. And Although I still did not know Jeffrey well, I didn't know the facts of Jeffrey. But I got a sense of Jeffrey as someone who was able to appreciate and someone who um, was able to express his gratitude, someone who struggled with depression to the point where he missed some of his classes, enough of his classes that his classmates noticed he was missing. And that um, he had a real sense of justice and he seemed to be looking at what, this is just my conjecture here, that Jeffrey seem to be looking at through his course materials um, what justice was, what role systems theory may play in uh, justice and equality in our society. Um, but that's just my conjecture. Jamba, please don't put down your conjecture. Don't say just my conjecture. That's my conjecture. Okay. That is my conjecture. All right. All right. And, and truthfully, I have a lot of 
faith in that conjecture. Good. I'm, I'm not often wrong on things like that. <laughs> but um, to answer your question about how did, like, I'm not sure how the question was worded. But Basically, what's Jeffrey doing around here? Exactly. Europe? We're here talking to about Jeffrey tonight because we, Jeffrey is us. Mm. And we are Jeffrey. I mean, Jeffrey... Um, all of us who uh, teach or go to class or work at Naropa, Jeffrey is us. And we are Jeffrey even now. And so it's entirely appropriate for someone who is us to be here with us. Thank you, Jumper. Thank you. And don't just, please, if you want to clap, that's all right. But remember, clapping doesn't get you excused from participating in other ways, okay? <laughs> clapping is not a democratic project. Clapping is what you do when you see people perform. But what we're doing is now is trying to get us engaged and jump comes with a deep sense of engagement and suggests some things to us about what it means for a Buddhist university to go beyond the words of talking about we are one. Jampo is saying that you don't discover that we are really one until you discover each other, and especially each other in trouble. And if we stand away from each other, especially in trouble, then we don't know anything about being one. Jampa, you are really something. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else want to speak to that question about what is Jeffrey doing here and what does he have to do with Boulder, with Naropa, with us? Yes, my friend. That's like going and looking for your voice, isn't it? Okay. Yes, something like that. Yes. Um, I'm Sarah Oglesby Dunnigan. I am from northern Colorado. I was born in Greeley and grew up in Fort Collins and all across the Front Range. I spent 15 years in the Dallas area as well. So that, that plays part of my story. Um, let's see, my mother's mother, uh, Marjorie Hamill, grew up in Minnesota. And what do I have to do? Isn't the next one what I have to do with Naropa? Mm -hmm. I am uh, an MDiv student at ILIF and um, an intern minister at the um, Boulder Valley Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. And I got involved with a group called Together Colorado, which just started a Boulder clergy table this last fall. And um, as we started meeting, um, different folks came to the table to bring ideas about things we might work on together that would be of concern to this community that we serve. And uh, Don Matthews was one of those folks that showed up. Just about the time we were in conversation about what things were worthy of our time and energy and concern, and he brought the case of Jeffrey to our attention and um, to our prayers and um, it fit into a larger conversation that we were having about um, violence in our culture and about racism, about um, what kind of community we want to live in and how we will lead our congregations and our friends and our everyone that we run into into um, a better, better community. Um, 
I don't think there was a single one of us that, that he, he came to that meeting and we were all on board to be involved in whatever way we, we could um, because it was a very moving um, story. And for me personally, um, I worked in as a community organizer in Dallas for two years and then for 11 years in an urban community college in downtown Dallas. Um, and I taught in the Dallas prison system for a little while. And I worked at Community College of Denver too for a couple of years before going into ministry. For me, Jeffrey, he is us, and he is almost every student that I've worked with in different ways. Um, struggling to um, pull together pieces of ourselves, whether it's through mental illness or overcoming poverty or um, dealing with racism. I worked with students that dealt with so many of the same issues that Jeffrey oh. was facing. Right. And um, I felt like he was them. Thank so you very he much. is us, not yes, just Naropa is. us, but yes, us. Us. Yeah. Well, of course, the Buddhist teaching is that nothing that we teach about Buddhism and humanity is meant to be limited to Naropa. <laughs> Naropa is simply the point at which we practice moving out beyond Naropa. And you had the wonderful experience of having somebody come in to where you were. Just a Jampa had someone named Jeffrey come in to the class at Naropa. Is it possible that one of the things that uh, Jeffreys do for Naropa is to open up our reflection on what would Naropa be like if there were more Jeffreys among us? Are we too satisfied with what we are now and not remembering that it is as we dream of the possible that we become more human, not being satisfied with what is, but imagining what might be. I imagine Jeffrey coming back here after 50 of you have found your way at some point or another over to the jail where he is. Uh, one, two, three, four, or seven times to visit him and talk with him and chant with him. And Jeffrey comes back. Can you imagine what it will be like for Jeffrey to come back and for Naropa to be a place where Jeffrey's come back? Anybody else want to say anything more about response to what Jeffrey has to do with us? Yes, friend. Hi, I'm uh, Phil Stanley. <clears throat> First name? Phil David. I go by my middle name now, David okay. Phil Stanley. Um, I was born in Port Sulphur, Louisiana, uh, but we moved a lot. I moved to Franklin, Louisiana, Hattiesburg, Mississippi, Sydney, Australia, Melbourne, Australia. What are Australia. all these Southerners doing around here? <laughs> Did high school Maybe they're attracted by Jeffrey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, high school in Connecticut, et cetera. So. Uh, my um, mother's mother uh, was born in uh, northern Texas on a farm, dry land farm, uh, west of Lubbock. So it's in the Panhandle. Um, let's see, my role, I'm a professor of Buddhism. Oh, her name, uh, Ruth Willis. Um, and uh, my role at Europe, I'm a professor in religious studies of Buddhism. I had Jeffrey um, in a meditation class, a graduate, their second meditation course in Buddhist meditation, the spring before the summer brawl. And uh, he would come into my office hours and we, he would talk about his struggles, both uh, mental issues and substance abuse. And uh, he would miss classes, as Jampa would mention, and that was a reason often for him to come talk to me. 
And then when the summer event happened, I started going to the county jail to see him at first. I think I was the only person who was seeing him. And eventually MDiv students started seeing him. And, and uh, as the trial came near, um, Matt, Don Matthew helped reach out to the larger community. And I continued to meet with Jeffrey regularly. So we became pretty close. Um, and one thing I would say about um, his life story, and it took a while to figure it out, was or, you know to learn more about it, I should say, is that <clears throat> he's a person of great uh, insight. Of he's had a lot of suffering. Uh, he thinks very carefully about life. But um, his, his starting in college, he started drinking a lot. He had psychological problems emerge. There were money problems. He couldn't afford meds and um, had trouble having a stable house and really had psychological uh, problems and drinking problems and so forth. And I got a strong hit of a person who was extremely intelligent, a lot of longing to change himself, to work with his situation and to improve it, but that there were structural aspects of his life that really made his situation much difficult, that the... Um, like the lack of money to take drugs and so forth really compounded his problem. So I, I got a sense that he, when he, he actually, as time went on, in a sense confessed that he, he did in fact have a broken bottle in his hand. It's not entirely clear that he actually acted to cut the guy's neck, but the guy's neck got cut. And he, at some point, finally said to me that the lawyers did not want him to, he wanted to say it all, just tell the court everything and let the chips fall where they fell. And the, the lawyers talked him out of that. There was no weapon found. They thought they could uh, cast doubt on the court, and they pursued that line of defense. And towards the end, he was so relieved to just confess to the court that he, he when he was being sentenced. And um, so he, there was a real strong sense of personal responsibility, but also you, you could feel the sense of social tragedy of all the forces around him that made his situation worse, and that if they had been otherwise, these problems would not have got the best of him. So on one hand, he accepted responsibility, but there was clearly a larger set of causes that really made his situation far worse and far more likely for him to be in trouble. And one last thing I would say is that his aspiration to change himself, to transform himself, is something that is widely shared by our Naropa students. And that when his life fell apart, he had a football scholarship at his BA college, and he was kicked out, lost the scholarship, drugs, alcohol stuff. Uh, he eventually finished the BA, but he had this longing to change himself, and he found Naropa. And he knew that the students at Naropa shared this sort of aspiration that they have different sorts of issues in their life, and they uh, have varying degrees of sense of struggle, but they all share this quality of wanting to change themselves. And Jeffrey recognized that and came to Naropa to try to help himself. And the tragedy is that he didn't have enough time to work it out before his problems got the, the better of him, so. Phil, thank you very much. It's Phil, right? Yes. yes. Thanks for sharing that with us. One of the things that we always have to be very careful about, not frightened about, but careful about, as we come together under Jumper's call that we are all one together. He is me, I am him. We have to be careful about whether or not Jeffrey becomes a show for us. an interesting thing to look on and explore. And that can only happen when we forget the words from Jampa Jeffrey is me, not some oddity for me to explore outside of me, 
but Phil testified to the fact that one of the great gifts of Jeffrey was that he understood that he was not the only Jeffrey at Naropa. And that there were many other people going through struggles to become their best selves and to get rid of their worst selves. And I would guess that maybe after whatever time he's going to have to stay there, he might return to encourage us to be sure that we engage in as much self-reflection as we can, not just looking at poor Jeffrey, but asking what does Jeffrey mean for who I am? I want to do something that elders do too often, uh, but sometimes it's necessary, and that is tell a story about what this conversation has reminded me of. I was deeply involved in the struggles in Mississippi over, uh, among other things, the right to vote and the right to be human beings. Uh, during the 1960s. And I heard uh, a reporter uh, from one of the national newspapers who had come down to uh, report on Mississippi tell about a conversation he had had with a poor white sharecropper there in Mississippi. And basically, he asked this poor white sharecropper, in Europe, the term would be peasant. He asked him, why was he opposing black people having the right to vote? And the response of the poor white peasant was, well, hell. If I'm better than a nigger, then who am I better than? I tell the story partly because I have seen enough to know that the great temptation is not simply to be in solidarity, but to be overwhelmed by feeling sorry for, and then be overwhelmed by being glad that that's not me. And as you all know, from your own work in meditation, sanghas, reading, we have these tricky monkey minds <laughs> who jump all over in a variety of ways. I would like to encourage you to see the Jeffreys as wonderful gifts to become even more honest with ourselves than we are now, and not to be so overwhelmed with loving Jeffrey, that we forget what it means to love ourselves. Tough love to ourselves. All of that leads me into my desire to open up this conversation a bit more beyond Jeffrey. But before I do that, I'd like to know if anybody is, in addition, wanting to speak to, about, for, with Jeffrey. 
and I'm sorry, I saw you standing there, but it just didn't come through to me. I'm so glad you just stood there. <laughs> In about three minutes, you should have been shouting, <laughs> but you didn't have to shout. Somebody shouted inside, somebody raised their hand and said, look over there, young man. <laughs> and so that was very, very helpful. And then there was nothing in here too, is that it? Okay, let's start with you, my brother. I didn't want to interrupt you, so. Thank you very much, <clears throat> but sometimes people need to be interrupted. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my name is Peter Cedergren. I graduated from Naropa in the MACP program about five years ago. Good. Um, I was born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area. My Peter, was, was Naropa a good experience for you? It was an excellent experience. Wonderful, okay. Yes, I very much appreciated it. Um, deepened who I am the experience of who I am and my experience in the world. Um, <clears throat> my grandmother, uh, her name was Catherine Glennon. She uh, was born and raised in Ireland, um, came to the, this country when she was quite young, about 12 or so. Um, and I am a therapist, psychotherapist, and I work with men who have been convicted of committing sex offenses, sexual offenses. And it's from my work, working with these men, uh, that ties into what you just spoke to, as well as what s spoke to me about Jeffrey, the, our shadow nature, the aspects of ourselves that we don't want to accept, um, we put on to others to feel okay about ourselves. Um, and I find this, myself and my colleagues talk about um, when they tell people, people ask them, what do you do for a living? And, and when they say, oh, I'm a sex offender therapist, people oftentimes react with uh, shock and sometimes say things like, oh, why would you want to do that? Um, and they recoil. And <coughs> so some of my colleagues actually avoid telling people what they do. And what I've seen is that uh, these men that I work with, um, they're just average people. You have extremes anywhere from you know, you can have a pedophile on one end, and you can have someone that's uh, been caught maybe exposing themselves or doing something that's not as, as offensive. But my point is that it, it seems that our culture has now labeled like that group as the, the worst group of all of offenses. Uh, people tend to look at them as lower than murderers. That, and and I guess, you know, I'm trying to figure out just what it is I want to say. It's, Keep working on it. It's that we all have aspects of ourselves that do th things that we later may think why, how could I have done that? How could I have been that way? Um, and I think it gives our society some sense of superficial relief that we have these individuals we can say, that's the bad person, and they've been locked away, and that person is given the burden of our shadow. And what we need to do is, as you were saying, we are Jeffrey, and Jeffrey is us, and we are all connected, and we all hold this, hold these things, and we need to recognize that, take ownership of that, and 
what is it in our society, in our culture, the way we treat each other, that individuals do commit crimes because they have not been cared for correctly and properly and compassionately and that we're all responsible. Every single one of us is responsible. And until that's recognized and embraced, we will not have a truly democratic and free world. It's Peter? Yes. Somebody told me that Naropa does not have any great difficulty talking about what it means to embrace these things and admit them. But then the person said, but Naropa has great difficulty in moving beyond we are all this or whatever it is to and now what we must do in this particular situation to change the situation is. Do you think that's something that Naropa needs some encouragement on, Peter? <clears throat> I think that would be excellent. <laughs> you um, are an expert now. You've been through it all, so I'm asking you for help. Because, yes, it does. I mean, I w when I went through my three-year MACP program, it, we were very isolated. We had our little campus out on the other part of town, and um, we... <laughs> We all became very close, my cohort. However, we didn't go out into the wider world to really experience that and to share what we had, were learning and were doing our best to embody. And we didn't study hard on how to bring the wider world into where we are which is what Jeffrey in some ways represents. I hope that among all the other things that have done in relationship to Jeffrey, there will be some careful examination of how he got here. Not because we see him as a great road scholar possibility and we're gonna do it again somehow but he came here he opened up in us some things that never would have been opened up otherwise somebody should be thinking hard working hard to figure out how he got here and how could more Jeffreys get here Or is that too much, Jeffrey? <laughs> you keep leaning this way. I don't want you to fall off oh, your seat. Fall. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want to say something before a, a sister comes no, in? Gina Klein. Um, Speak up, please, dear. I'm Gina Klein, and I was born in North Georgia, and my grandmother. <laughs> my grandmother. Going to have a congressional <laughs> investigation here. <laughs> my grandmother, Alice Hill, grew up in North Georgia, and I'm um, staff here at Naropa in the religious studies. You department. still are not coming across. I'm, I'm staff. I need to hear women's voices more than men's. <laughs> okay. We've been hearing men's for 7,000 years. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to practice it. You're not being sultry and nice and <laughs> soft. You are telling us what's on your heart. Okay. So 
Is this better? That's a little better. Okay. I don't think it's me. I think it's the microphone. Um, <laughs> okay. It's you. All right. <laughs> um, I, to, to answer that question of, about Jeff, um, I think Jeff is here because, for me, Jeff is here because I feel personally responsible. I'm sorry, I, I went to say this and it's, it's just really hard. Um, Jeff's situation completely cracked my heart open, finally. I mean, I'm 53 years old. I used to um, teach on an Indian reservation. I lived for years. I, if you had told me back then I was a racist, I would have been mortified. I would have said, how can you call me a racist? I, I'm a good person. I tried to help people. And I have come to realize how complicated it is. I mean, Jeff himself is a racist. He has a white father who persuaded him that, that he couldn't, he couldn't, he only recently came to see his situation as being about his race, even though in that fight, the two white men have been regarded as victims and he was facing up to 32 years in prison convicted by a white jury. And it was only after I started to care about Jeff personally, hearing his voice on the phone, getting those phone calls from the Boulder County Jail. There's a collect call on the line and then hearing Jeff's voice and this beautiful voice and then and getting to know him and then looking at how he was presented in the newspaper, he was not described as being part of the Boulder community. He was not described as being a student at Naropa. He was described as being a transient. He was not acknowledged in any way. So, it, it was only in getting to know Jeff, in Jeff's situation personally, that I realized that all my life by not, by, by my chauvinism and by my sep sense of separation that I participated in Jeff's incarceration. And we all did. We all do. Any of us who have not done anything are responsible. Part of what makes you you is the many levels of miseducation that you, like all the rest of us, have experienced in this society. That is one of the major reasons, Gina, why I am hoping that Naropa will not be satisfied with simply being a part of the great ranks of miseducating institutions because it creates terrible things even when it thinks it's creating beautiful things. And so the question is, how do we enter the ranks of beauty, real beauty? Teaching, acting, maybe some of, the, some of the students should have been down on the steps of that newspaper the next morning, <coughs> demonstrating and saying, this was our brother. How come you didn't see that? And then, all kinds of other things could begin to happen once we figure out 
that for one thing, our education is not meant to be kept in here. And secondly, that wherever our sisters and brothers are in trouble, that's where we belong. And thirdly, that it is in the process of belonging with our sisters and brothers that we educate most truthfully and not most separately as we are so tempted to do in American society. But I want you to know how important it is for you to share with us what you share. You are, of course, moving very gingerly around some very tricky areas in American culture today, including race and sex and all the ways in which they relate or don't relate to each other, including, as you say, the recognition that white people have been some of the least educated people about the true nature of America that there is. And that is part of what's on my heart when I then begin to ask, can you have a true multiracial American democracy unless somebody is teaching the truth about America and about who we are and about where we can possibly go? So even though I raised my voice at you, my dear sister, and told you you should speak louder, I am not backing off on that one. <laughs> you have a lot to say. Do not apologize for your tears. Tears are proof of our humanity. And let's keep going and trying to figure out how to bring Naropa in touch with all the Jeffreys who need Naropa and with all the Jeffreys that Naropa needs. And what we know clearly is that it will bring tears, it will bring pain, but some of us teach that that is the truth that Buddhism puts forward that there is no full human development without pain and suffering. I just want to say too that- Please, um, go ahead, dear. I, so this is, <laughs> it's all white people talking. So I just want to say, um, I hope Did I'm you look at me? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I hear what you're saying. Oh, it's coming. Let me go. I'm from Memphis, Tennessee. <laughs> All right, the takeover. <laughs> and I'm struggling. Oh, you know my Struggling. Andrea. <laughs> I'm Andrea Aguist, and I'm a staff here at Naropa, and I've been here two years. And, um, and I'm struggling at bringing up a 13-year-old. Can you not hear me? <laughs> Where am I from? Memphis, Tennessee. My grandma. Oh, sorry. My grandmother, which one? <laughs> my mother, my mother's uh, mother, grandmother, is from Nashville, and when and I was what a little, was her name, dear? Her name was um, um, Alice Smith, and she was the only one of eight children who um, attended in uh, college and got her master's. And um, in fact, my mother was raised in Nashville, and when we were little children, my brothers and sisters and I, we would 
be sat down by my mother and say, said that you may be from Memphis, but you are not of Memphis. <laughs> so we thought she was kind of very much a psychologist at that time. Sorry, no offense. Um, but anyway, um, I'm struggling as a parent bringing up a black child yes. here. And I grew up and was born in 1964 post-civil rights with all the civil rights greats. And Maxine Smith, as you know, just passed away. And I, was, I grew up during a time when, as light as I am, I was explicitly told. In fact, friends that I can go back, you know, years and years from the time we were three were told the same thing in so many words by their parents. You are black. You always have to be on your P's and Q's. You will never be given a break. You have an obligation to serve and to do something with your life. And at that same message was coupled with it doesn't matter what else you are, whatever else makes, is, it comprises your ethnicity. You are black, period. And so I married a man who looks blacker than me, but he really, he's foreign. He's from another country. And um, that's a good thing. He's West Indian. He grew up between Dominica and England. And so we're raising a 13-year-old child who yes. is wanting to embrace yes. this the differences and the rich culture that her father comes from. And I can, I, I can only tell her why well, I can go to as far as Philadelphia um, and parts of Tennessee, but I really can't tell you everything about your mommy's heritage. And but you must then enlist her to eventually tell her mama. To, okay. Because she may be the one She's interested. Who, will, who will do the genealogical yeah. research. So don't, don't discourage her. Out. No, tell her that that's your job now. Right. So, okay. my question, so my question is this. Whereas I know it may seem harsh what my parents and other parents told kids like me, you are black and that's it. At the same time, I understand it. And um, I really fully embrace it. Um, at the same time, I'm understanding her point of view and wanting to encourage the adoption of whatever else she wants to be. Mm -hmm. But it makes me sad as well that she doesn't have the kind of black experience with black kids uh, growing up that I did. Yes. And, um, and I don't know how to encourage that yes. in really pretty much a non-diverse mm -hmm. place like Boulder. Boulder. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> have yes. as. Thank Tell me your first name again. Andrea. Andrea. Thank you, Sister Andrea. Before our brother speaks, may I call your attention to the fact that we agreed at the outset that this was not just an evening with Vincent Harding. Therefore, Andrea's question was not simply a question to Vincent Harding. Andrea, speaking as a loving mother in a very difficult situation, is asking for help. As I understand it, help begins with just the process thinking about Andrea's situation. Not having all the answers, not having any answers, but saying, I am listening, Andrea. And then seeing what the spirits may hold for us as a result of listening carefully to the calls of our sisters and brothers. You don't have to know the answer but you do have to listen to the question and let it become your question. Andrea, let me hold my response until your fellow microphone uh, holder uh, has his chance to come in. 
and then let me try. There may be some others who also want to try to respond to your question. Please, dear brother. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay, great. I, too, am a Georgia boy. <laughs> so, this is like a historical moment for Georgia, me. Mississippi, Tennessee, <laughs> Kentucky, wow. I'm Any Coloradans around here? Unfortunately, <laughs> I've witnessed more Georgians here than I have throughout any part of the state, so I, I feel good. good. <laughs> but at any rate, I was born down in Albany, Georgia, two hours south of uh, Atlanta. Eric Nelson, my apologies. Uh, born in Albany, Georgia, uh, two hours south of Atlanta. And my grandmother is Ella Lee Rowdy, um, and she was born, I do believe my mom said, in Dawson, Georgia, which is Terrell County, 30 minutes uh, East. Terrible Terrell. No, not terrible, Terrell. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we used to call it Terrible Terrell. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. Right on. Um, how I come about here with um, Naropa, I, I responded to an email uh, for the invitation uh, for this event. Uh, what I do for a living, or shall I say involved in, I'm involved in many uh, different organizations and volunteer for many but uh, one of which I believe that relates to here is I'm the vice president of the Aurora branch of the NAACP, as well as the vice president of the state conference of Colorado, Montana, and Wyoming uh, for the NAACP. Um, what I do for a living, I'm an adjunct professor up at CSU. Uh, I teach African American studies and African American history and I rotate between CSU and CU Denver. So there are instructors out there to help teach the culture of the African American community. Um, my thing is, I wanted to know, as I'm learning more and more about this case, forgive me because I do travel a lot, is that what was the level of support given for our brother? And what I'm, I'm more interested now in learning and hearing more about, or shall I say dialogue, and what are we doing as a diverse community to number one, identify, number two, provide a solution, and number three, prevent more cases like Jeffrey. Can we, are we gonna bring that village mentality back? As Peter stated, we are responsible. So can we bring that back? Thank you very much. Eric, is it? Yes, sir. Okay. Eric, can you, do you mind telling us when you were born? No, don't, you don't have to worry. Um, August 26, 1978. Okay. 78? Yes, sir. Okay. And I am a psychologist, too. Okay. <laughs> Eric, I first came to your town 17 years before you were born. Yes, with Dr. King and the movement there. Okay. So we have to have a conversation about what you have been going through. Let me just quickly say a little bit more to Andrea's situation. One, let me share with you words from a letter that was sent to me, that was sent to me about two months ago. I'm part of an organization that has begun to come together, calling ourselves the Council of Elders. And one member of that council, uh, happens to be the f person who was the first black mayor of Berkeley, California. And Gus wrote these words that I believe are words for all of us. He said, we all need to recognize 
and Tyrone is especially for you, okay? We all need to recognize that the great American experiment of a multiracial democracy is still in the laboratory. <laughs> laboratory, <laughs> experiment, laboratory, okay? That has great meaning for me, Andrea, partly because it tells me again something that I'm very, very clear about, and that is that we still have great work to do to build a truly multiracial democracy. And part of the work that we have to do is how shall we deal with children who are growing up in settings that are absolutely different than the ones that we grew up in. Somebody mentioned the village. How do you, instead of crying about the fact that we no longer have the village that we once had and that raised the children, how do we create new villages that are going to be very different in terms of their externals but will have the same internal commitment to raising the children? as the best possible children they could be. As I hear it, that means that somebody at Naropa, somebody in Boulder, has got to walk up to the side of Andrea and put their arm around her <coughs> and say, Sister, I hear what you were saying about your daughter. Could we just walk a little together and see if we can ask some other folks, read some stuff, think of some stuff, chant quietly, expressing her need and our need? You see, these are not all simply, quote, social, political issues. These are deeply spiritual issues that we are being called upon to work with. And Naropa has the great, great privilege of being pushed into this arena. I hope that it will have the spirit and the compassion and the love to cause it to give thanks for being pushed. Not to figure out how to get away from the pushing, but how to get even more deeply into it, because it may well be that the great divine spirit is doing the pushing. Andrea's question is a, is a powerful question for us all. There are were, there were lots of simple ways. Just let me give you one example. This same brother, Gus, who wrote the letter to me, you know what he's doing this summer? He is taking his 13-year-old granddaughter and six of her friends and is going to take them on a drive through all of the civil rights campaign 
hotspots. Albany, Birmingham, Jackson, Mobile, wherever, to help those children who get none of this in their public schools or private schools and tell them essentially, this is where you came from. Even more importantly, this is where America of 2013 came from. And tell them that we need you to carry on so that America by 2025 will not die of fright because there are no more, quote, minorities, <laughs> except white ones. <laughs> it's a wonderful opportunity, isn't it? It's a great privilege that we have at this point in history. And I believe enough, I've been around Naropa ever since its earliest days. And I believe that whoever you understand the divine spirit to be is literally going to whip you all if you don't jump into the great responsibility that you have for making this a better country by going out finding the Jeffreys, going out, finding the teachers, like the one who's walking to the mic now, going out, finding those who can come and create difficulties. Because you have to have difficulties to get from where you are to where you need to be. Everybody knows that on a personal level. That's certainly the case on an institutional level. You cannot move forward without difficulties. My favorite example is, <laughs> what if the caterpillar simply sat around and said, this is the way I am, this is the way I am. <laughs> And you don't want me to go into all that, do you? <laughs> and never fly. And never fly. I don't think Naropa was created to never fly. Hmm. And I'd like to just let you know that that's what's been on my heart for Naropa for a long, long time. Before Brother Don takes me from behind the table here, I'd like to make a couple of recommendations to you. One, Jeffrey has introduced some of us, at least, to the prisons. If we were looking and listening closely, he introduced some of us, at least, to the relationship of the prisons to young men of color. It's one of the great scandals of American life today the prisons, and their relationship to young men of color. I would strongly like to recommend that those of you who have not yet ever picked up a relatively new and magnificent book called The New Jim Crow, get it. The first name of Sister Alexander is jumping away from me. Michelle. Michelle. 
Alexander is the author. The New Jim Crow, basically talking about mass incarceration as another kind of slavery in the American society, but even more as something that leads to a deep, deep division in American life when Naropa is committed to a joining of our humanity. Get something that will not make you comfortable at all and wrestle with it. There's a wonderful study guide that goes along with it and that through um, Don and others here, I can help you find ways of getting the study guide uh, for no charge at all. I want to recommend that as something that Naropa might want to think about very seriously as perhaps a common study experience. I don't know how you do those things here, but I know that at many, many institutions and uh, cities and towns, the experience of studying one thing together can be a very <coughs> powerful uh, experience. I pass that on as one recommendation. The second ex ex uh, recommendation repeats Jeffrey. I am going to personally do everything I can to see Jeffrey face to face. I would like to strongly recommend that as many of you who are Jeffrey's spiritual, institutional sisters and brothers, mothers and fathers, find a way to get to see him in prison. I have for a lot of my life been deeply moved and embraced by the one who taught that if we are really to see the great creator, we must go by way of the prisons. I have a friend who teaches at a seminary who said, if you listen to Jesus, you get the idea that if you want to go to heaven, you need a letter of recommendation from poor people. <laughs> Don, were you standing up to sing again? <laughs> <laughs> I just want, I just had one testimony before we, well, one point of information, one testimony. Uh, it might burst, I might go in the song, you never know. It's the, it's okay. the, it's the spirit, whatever the spirit we does. Won't say, we won't try to stop you. <laughs> I'd like to teach a song before we finish that. Right, well, well, we'll let you close with that teaching. I need to say I'm Don Matthews, I'm from Chicago, Illinois. My grandmother was Esther Welch from Greenville, Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> Associate Professor of Religious Studies here. And Jeffrey Nearing is innocent, quite frankly. Person who had double diagnosis of, of mental illness, alcohol abuse. Where I came from, you take people, if they have an altercation like that, you take them to the hospital. You don't take them to jail. You don't take them to jail. The reason why the judge gave him the minimum sentence possible is because he knew that. He knew that the police mishandled evidence. <laughs> you know, how, how can you lose the, the knife that's supposed to kill this new, not kill, attempted murder, slice them? How do you lose that as a police officer? That's, that's hard to do. State crime, right? we don't know where it is. Where is that? How do, how do you make those mistakes about them? How do you ignore that he's got this medication in his pocket, but you don't give him treatment? <laughs> Jeffrey wrote me a letter, so they wouldn't give me my my medication in prison. He started to hallucinate. He started to have depression. His mom told me they won't give him his medication. I called the prison and said, what, what the hell is going on? Excuse my language. I don't want to preach, right? <laughs> 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 he 
He's innocent. I've been in states when people have mental illnesses and they quote commit crimes, <laughs> they take them to the hospital. They don't take them to jail. But in Boulder, Boulder County and other places, in urban areas, black men especially, they take them to jail. They don't give them a chance. I've had mentally ill people in my family who've done some things worse than Jeffrey. But because we were living in the right place, they took them to the hospital, not to jail. No one even mentioned his mental illness until his sentence. Because he was so ashamed. His parents made him, his father made him so ashamed of being mentally ill. See, Jeffrey, I'd rather you go to prison than someone think you're mentally ill. You want to talk to me about Jeffrey? I'll, I'll talk to you about it afterwards. The man's innocent. But he's a, he's a stand up guy. <laughs> you know? And so he said some things. Even, even the forensic evidence doesn't match. The forensic evidence says the person was cut by a knife, not by a jagged piece of <laughs> glass that Jeffrey quote, confessed to. Even the judge said that, Jeffrey, you were so coked up, you don't know what, what you did, do you? <laughs> his mother, he, he told his mother three different stories about what he was supposed to have done. He's mentally, he was mentally ill. He was under the influence of alcohol and cocaine. He should have gone to the hospital, not to jail. The man was innocent. And even if he wasn't innocent, <laughs> still my brother, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's why I hear my brother's brothers and sisters. He's still my brother. That's what and he is joking. still filled with the Buddha spirit. There you go. There you go. There you go. Jeffrey's meditating. He, he wants to know what, what, what groups can he get involved in. He wants people to visit. He asks he asks us to send him books on Buddhism. He wants to continue his education. There are practical ways in which you can help Jeffrey. If you want to do that, let him talk to me. We'll talk about that. I think the rope has a responsibility to the Jeffreys. <laughs> He taught my class something that nobody else could teach them. When they sat in that classroom and saw this guy getting railroad, they said, is this America? Is this America? They got it, finally. What it means like to be stigmatized by either race or gender or mental illness or whatever, or whatever. He taught us something, and Jeffrey understands that. <laughs> he says, Dallas, there's gotta be some greater good that, that came out of this. I understand that. The rope is at a crossroads, like Dr. Harding said. It's at a crossroads. Which way are we going to go? We've been making some bad decisions lately. Where are we going to go? Where are we going to go? Who knows? Uh, well, I promise you, uh, I'm going to keep reminding you. you know, and, and Angela Davis had a statement. I know, I know our Brother Harding remembers this. They come, if they come for me in the morning, they're going to come for you in the night. We need solidarity on this campus. We need to understand what that means. I'm proud of my students, <laughs> many of them who are sitting up there. I'm proud of my colleagues who have who've decided to, to take a stance for justice and for, and for righteousness and for freedom. And, and with the power of God, all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, we're going to keep on keeping on. I promise you that. The reason why I'm not letting some people speak now because we're hitting 9 o'clock, well, this is just the first of conversations we're going to have that will extend next year. This is not the last. This is the first. And we hope that Brother Vincent and other folk like him will come and continue this educational process. I'm, I'm proud of people who were able to, to say where they were, how they got there. And now, as, as Dr. King, in his, in his latest book, what was that, Dr. Harding? Chaos or Community? Where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? Chaos or community? That's right. That's right. We're at a crisis in our society and in our nation. And so with that, I want to thank you. I think we should all thank you for, for being here as our brother. And I'm going to let you lead us in a song as uh, we close. <laughs> well, not let you. I'm going to request Good. that you lead us in a song. KGNU is taping, right? KGNU is taping. We are doing amazingly well on time. (laughs) 
let me remind you of something that was in our program tonight. At the bottom of the page where our dialogue is being discussed, the question is raised, what are the barriers to building a multiracial democratic society at Naropa and in Boulder County? What are possible solutions for overcoming those barriers? Let me tell you about the strange tendency that I have. I never ask that as a first question. For me, the first question is, what are the great resources that we have for building a truly multiracial society starting at Naropa? And I, I believe that is the question to ask, the assumption to make that more than any obstacles, there are great gifts. Amen. And the question is, if we focus on the gifts, perhaps the obstacles will get smaller and smaller. And vice versa. It's in that context that I'd like to teach you all a song. I once had a, a Vietnamese brother who had been part of the anti-colonial movement in this country even before we arrived there. And we were talking about singing. And he said, he happens to be a great authority and researcher on liberation movements around the world. He said, Vincent, I don't know of any real freedom movements where the people don't sing together. Now, of course, I don't know what Naropa's practice is here, but what I'd like to do is add to you a gift one of the gifts of song. There is a tune that many of you probably know from your history or your present to the, to the African American spiritual, We Are Climbing Jacob's Ladder. Some of you know that song? Can I see your hands? Okay, well, you've already got half learned what you need to learn. We're going to sit and practice for two stanzas, and then the third stanza we're going to stand and sing together, okay? Let me just quickly remind you, we are climbing Jacob's ladder. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. Okay, but now it is. We are building up a new world. We are building up a new world. We are building up a new Builders must be strong. Builders must be strong. Okay, that's for us. We sing that to and for each other. There's a second stanza. I'm sneaking this in on you. Courage, sisters, don't get weary. Courage, brothers, don't get weary. Courage, people, don't get weary, though the way be long. Courage, sisters, don't get weary. Courage, brothers, don't get weary. Courage, people, 
Don't get weary, though the way be long. And then there's the last stanza. Rise, shine, give God glory. Rise, shine, give God glory. Rise, shine, give God glory. Children of the light. Let's stand and sing that last one, and then maybe the first tune. Rise, shine, give God glory. Rise, shine, give God glory. Rise, shine, give God glory. Children of the we are climbing. We are climbing. No, I'm sorry, sorry. We are building up a new world. We are building up a new world. We are building up a new world. Building. Be strong, be strong, yeah. well, right.